Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered here today on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Welcome to the UBC Center for Migration Studies Speaker Series. My name is Nancy Clark, and I'll be moderating today's event with Dr. Cohen on extending the reach of academic research through PhotoVoice, the lived experience of aging immigrant project. You can follow us uh, on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is up on the PowerPoint slide here, and it's at UBC Migration. This event today is brought to you by a collaborative grant through UBC Center for Migration Studies, Arts Engaged Methodologies with Newcomer Communities in Canada. Our speaker presentation will go for approximately 45 minutes. At that time, we'd like to invite you to engage in a Q&A conversation for about 30 minutes, and we'll conclude our session at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We ask that you post your questions in the Q&A chat or raise your hand. It is with great pleasure that I would now like to introduce Dr. Sharon Cohen. Dr. Cohen is principal of Sharon Cohen Research Consulting. She is a trained medical anthropologist. She conducts interdisciplinary community-based research with immigrant older adults with dementia, healthcare access, chronic disease, self-management support, quality of life, and mental health promotion are foundations of her work. She is also the senior lecturer in the Department of Gerontology at Simon Fraser University, where she teaches courses on cultural migration on, and aging, health, um, as well as uh, healthcare issues for minority adults, death and dying, health, illness, and later life, and intersectional ageism. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Cohen, and it's with great pleasure that we look forward to your presentation. Good morning. Thank you so much, Nancy, and uh, welcome everyone. So I am Sharon Cohen, and I am speaking to you, in fact, from the traditional and ceded territories of the Sunamuk and Tsleilamon uh, First Nations and Cowichan tribes on Vancouver Island. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to take you through our lived experiences uh, aging immigrants project. And I'm going to ask that, or at least I am going to take my images here at the side and just get them out of the way of my slides. <laughs> you may be able to see me still, but I can't see you. <laughs> I'm happy to take your questions at the end. So this is a joint project. It's important to acknowledge all of the participants, especially my colleagues Shari Brotman at the School of Social Work and Ilian Ferrer uh, at McGill, sorry, and Ilian Ferrer now at Carleton University. And uh, we also, uh, for this project, uh, brought on board some very important advisory groups um, who uh, provided a lot of sage advice and practical assistance. Um, and you may recognize some of those groups here. Uh, in Vancouver, I think I've got a couple of members from Mosaic. Hello, Kim, if you're here. Um, and they were part of this project as well. I'll speak to that more later. So the research project that I'm going to speak to today asks the research question, how do immigrant and racialized older adults experience aging in Canada? And specifically, how do their complex and intersecting identities combine with often invisible institutional structures and relationships of power to shape their interactions with family, community, and the state in their everyday lives? This project arose out of our concern with the fact that theoretical perspectives that incorporate race or ethnicity or culture are still not well developed in the aging literature, even today. There appears to be very little consensus on how to use the terms, even though there seems to be agreement that when this dimension is factored in, it accounts for disparities in health and well being. Critics of Canada's multicultural programs and um, and policies maintain that they place undue emphasis on the individualized attainment of cultural competency and language skills at the expense of attending to the persistent 
racism and ethnocentrism inherent in institutional structures that undermine these efforts. Ethnocentrism refers to the idea that we design things according to our own view of the world and don't recognize that it is in fact culturally informed, which is very often the case with, minor with majority governments and majority cultures as we see in Canada. So the objectives of our research then um, to address these gaps in the literature were to explore lived experiences of immigrant older adults, to study the impact of immigration on aging within the context of their life histories, to understand the intersections of identity, social location and structural discrimination across the lifespan, to explore the ways in which structural discrimination across the life course shapes interactions with family, community and formal services, and finally to encourage knowledge exchange with service providers and policymakers. And to be clear, I, will, I won't be reporting on the findings from this research. We have a lot of those and um, we have published uh, several articles already. I'll show you where you can find those if you're interested. But I think you need to know what our goals were in order to make sense of the illustrations I'm gonna provide of the photo voice methodology that we used as part of this project. So, we conducted a series of three in-depth qualitative interviews with each of 19 ethnocultural minority older adults, age 60 plus in Greater Montreal and Quebec and Greater Vancouver, British Columbia. Participants were selected to represent maximal diversity across various axes of identity, but all of them were marginalized in some form. In a scoping review of the literature on the health and healthcare of immigrant older adults that we conducted uh, earlier in the decade, we found that in Canada, most studies were on Chinese Canadians and to a lesser extent on South Asian uh, older adults, especially those of Punjabi origins. Even though Filipino Canadians are the third largest immigrant group in Canada, and Korean Canadians are the third largest minority group in the Fraser Health region in BC, the literature on these groups is very scant. So our project set out to address that deficit in a small way. Participants interviewed for this project are Korean, Filipino, Latin American from various countries, Caribbean, Afghani, and Pakistani. And all of these groups are underrepresented in the literature. So here's how we went about conducting our project. Um, we used three frameworks, each of which complements the other. And we have um, an article published on this complementarity. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, but it sort of corresponds to uh, our different interviews that we conducted. In the first interview, which is around 90 to 120 minutes, participants were encouraged to talk openly about their lives and experiences that have shaped them into old age. Researchers kept track of the relative timing of major life events on a hand-drawn timeline, because people do tend to bop around a bit, and participants spoke to the significance of those events. This structured timeline was compared with thematic descriptions emerging from this interview. And we went back in the second interview, um, and the interviewer summarized the themes extracted from the interview from interview one in relation to the participants' timeline. So it gave us something to sort of anchor ourselves to. Participants were asked to reflect further on the stories they had shared, and the interview explored in more detail if and how the participants' interactions with the labor market, healthcare, education, and immigration had influenced their identities and ultimately their late life experiences. At the end of this interview, participants were given a camera and training on how to use it, and were asked to take photographs that tell stories about objects, places, and or people that are meaningful to them at this time in their lives. And finally, in a third interview, we asked participants, uh, so they went away and they took photographs. And then in a third interview, um, we asked participants to identify with the researchers input at times up to 10 photos that had the most meaning for them and explain uh, what they meant and why they were important. 
So I'm not going to uh, get into these other frameworks, the intersectional life course, uh, you know, in great depth, but I just like to touch on them so that you have a sense of how they do work very well together with, um, with photo voice, which is the focus of this particular um, presentation. So life course approaches typically focus on key events that happen on or out of time over the life course. Key events infer categories of identity that are often understood as dualisms. So male, female, married, unmarried, parent, childless, and so on. Um, but actually they're not. Even something like parent childless, you think, well, once you're a parent, you're a parent. And, and of course that's true, but there are different times in our life when the role of parent is uh, less central than it is at other times. So uh, all of these experiences tend to span continua between the extremes along the dimensions of identity, and they may cycle in and out of them at different times in their lives. So you may be an employee, an employer, you may be both in fact, but um, at different times in your lives. Another important piece as well uh, about the life course is that we have to understand the experience of key life events relative to multiple structural forces. And the susceptibility to these varies with each person's multiple intersecting identities, which is where intersectionality comes in. So various sources of oppression differentially impact people depending on their identity, which in turn influences their social locations. So you can see um, uh, these structural forces may include, uh, you know, the um, one's participation in primary or secondary labor markets. Globalization is a huge force. The politics of retirement, um, you know, all the policies that govern who gets what, uh, the ways in which poverty is racialized, um, the setup of our society is heterosexist, um, politics of migration, so uh, different rules and regulations that apply to different classes of um, immigrants, and neoliberal policies of care that transfer responsibilities from governments to individuals, um, uh, but label these as uh, freedom of choice. In this figure, you can see some of the key factors at play based on the relationship between structural forces and identities along, uh, among immigrant older adults that we interviewed. Our participants came from different countries, arrived in Canada under different immigration programs and at different times in their lives. Some came with their families intact, and, but for others, the cohesion of family was disrupted. And all of these factors challenged their identities and demanded resilience. So this is where photo voice comes in. Um, now, photo voice is, as Wang and Redwood Jones will tell you, and this is a good article, um, it's in Health Education and Behavior, uh, photo voice ethics perspectives from Flint photo voice. I can share these with you. Um, these references with you, but there are newer ones as well. But this one in particular is useful. It talks about photo voice as a form of participatory action research that gives voice to the voiceless. And in particular, it provides, um, by providing people with cameras, it gives people opportunities to record and reflect on their community's assets and concerns, to share these in groups and to reach out to policymakers. Now, one of the reasons that we um, think it's important to include um, the critical life course perspective and uh, intersectionality in the consideration of photo voice is because um, photo voice is a little bit theory light. It's based on uh, Paolo Freire's approach to critical education, but um, that doesn't give us very much guidance in terms of, uh, you know, how to analyze or uh, understand uh, or approach uh, the research questions. But as you're probably aware, Freire 
maintains that uh, no matter their station in life, um, people are capable of looking critically at the world. Um, they just need the proper tools. And one of those tools that it can enable to think people to think critically is a visual image, particularly when they're provided with the tool to create those visual images in the form of a camera. One thing about, uh, about Freire's uh, theorizing is that uh, a notable gap is uh, any absence of uh, discussion about domination of women by men. So uh, this has been supplemented with feminist theory in a number of different photo voice uh, exhibits. But, um, you know, we understand that uh, sexism interlocks with racism, uh, with uh, heteronormativity, and many other intersections of identity, which is why we expand that to intersectionality. Now there's a lot that you can read about the ethics of photo voice. Um, and again, this Lang and Redwood Jones article is a good one because that is the focus. Um, and we found that uh, a lot of what they were talking about really resonated with our project. So of course you um, utilize a consent form that is sort of your usual university consent form that explains to, you know, basic ethical protocols developed by the university and, uh, you know, REBs, and it's based on the principles of respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Um, so that's around confidentiality, volunteerism, and so on. Now, there is a second consent form that you need to use, and you need to train your participants to use it, and that's called acknowledgement and release. And it asks participants, that is the people taking the photographs, to obtain subject signatures before taking photographs. So the consent form not only addresses the issue of intrusion into an individual's private space, but it also helps address the question of intrusion into the private space of a group or neighborhood as well, because participants can be quite protective about the vulnerability of their communities or not, um, but the people that they photograph may be. And so there are some issues that come up that participants raise, um, but also ones that they may not think about. So one that they raise is their worry that asking for permission prior to taking a picture leads to a loss of spontaneity that prevents them from capturing the intended moment or idea. And, and that certainly is a limitation, absolutely. But one thing that they need to bear in mind is that even though the person didn't appear to have any objection to being photographed, um, it is possible to violate their privacy, raising the possibility later of retaliation. Um, and that might compromise participant safety, for example. So it's important to convey to participants that even though the subject appeared to be sitting innocently somewhere, for example, a photograph could show that he or she was at a particular location, possibly a place he would not want another person to know about. So, you know, you may be photographed at a senior center or at a hospital, say, and you don't want people to know that you went to the hospital or engaged with this particular group of seniors. Um, so, and then another issue is that people are often unsure about how the photograph is going to be used. And so it's important sometimes to uh, gain permission more than once uh, to use it in an exhibit versus using uh, a picture, say, in a publication later on. So one exception to the need to obtain signatures is if people were taking a picture of a group so large that individual faces were unrecognizable, or if the participant was focusing on an object like a building, obviously the building can't sign, but the photograph included a person who just happened to walk by. So what we would do for those is basically use um, editing to blur that person's face, but they do have to be blurred if you don't have permission. And participants were especially advised to learn the art of patience in photography, which can be difficult. Um, so I just wanna share with you um, a little 
sort of process map here from the community toolbox, um, which is a great toolbox for uh, conducting photo voice in community. I mainly want to show you this because um, there are a number of resources out there that talk about photo voice, but they are often focused on community applications as opposed to academic ones. And so uh, I just want to highlight what might be different if you're using this in an academic project. So you can see um, the participants are recruited and they may be uh, attached to a mentor facilitator or possibly staff and or volunteers. And so the community or the group you're working with is involved in planning the project and they would receive technical training like how to use a camera, training in ethical and safe photography in various situations, which is what I just discussed, and uh, also a group building and training in working in a group. So how do you, uh, you know, this is a, about collective action. So how do you work together and, and utilize your respective photographs to collectively say something? <clears throat> and you have to bear in mind that if you're going to employ staff or volunteers, they also need training in these various skills. So people go out and take pictures and then they come together um, you know, usually it's a community group or an organization, so they might meet weekly anyway, and they work regularly in small groups to discuss and reflect on their experience in the photographs and to choose the, you know, photographs or video sequences that they want to use in their exhibit that they're eventually going to present. And that may be um, a little bit different um, than than what we are looking at. Um, now, the aims of photo voice is making voices heard, encouraging self-development, and providing the means to generate income sometimes. Um, and that is definitely uh, the latter, is, is different to what people get out of participating in a research project that employs photo voice. But I just want you to uh, notice here um, this individual was one of the participants in our research project. That's me before I cut my hair. Um, and you can see that he's incredibly proud <laughs> as he's standing there. He exudes pride. He is extremely, uh, we asked if he would like to speak at the exhibit and he was incredibly proud to do so. He invited uh, a large number of members of his family, and this was really uh, an important event for him. So I think one of the things that this can do is, uh, it is parallel to the community event, is that it can provide people uh, with an opportunity to share their voice, where they don't often get that kind of opportunity. Um, our participants also got to keep their cameras. We paid them an honorarium of $50, and uh, we provided them with a color copy of the catalog, which is all of the, um, all of the panels that are included in the exhibit, um, in addition to uh, translations in their own language. Of, uh, of the panels relative to specific individuals. So if we interviewed a Korean, um, the panel would be um, translated into Korean and so on. So um, that those were some of the things that they got from the project. But what's important here is that in alignment with photo voice methodology, the research team framed the use of photographs as a political approach to research that aimed to encourage participants more active engagement in the research design, data analysis, and dissemination process. We explained how the photo voice exhibit aimed to bring together community groups, policymakers, and practitioners with the power to affect social change to improve the lives of affected communities. And this is in line with, you know, Wang and Redwood Jones and others who talk about community research projects. Accordingly, we asked participants to consider what they would like service providers and policymakers to know about their experience and how that could be reflected in their photographs. So I'm going to shift gears now then and 
dig into the exhibit itself to help me to talk about what we found and what kinds of things come up in a photo voice exhibit. Um, but I just want to do a quick time check here. Yeah, okay, we're good. All right. <clears throat> so here I want you to see what people had to say when we asked them what is important to your experience of aging in Canada. The photographs gave participants opportunities to extend topics that we touched on in the interview or to raise complete, completely new ones. And often the meaning extends well beyond the image. So for example, Milena, who took this photograph, explained that whenever she stands at the grave of her daughter who died at the age of 30, she deeply regrets having to send her back to Chile for two and a half years as a toddler when she was unable to juggle single parenthood and work as a new immigrant. So at first you may wonder why her daughter's grave is important. Her daughter uh, only died very recently before we interviewed her. So it was dominating her life. But the fact that she has that lingering regret that she lost those years is incredibly important to this. But there's another piece to this as well. And that is that Milena's photograph was very aesthetically pleasing. Um, and that's important in relationship to authorship. So participants and researchers jointly identified 10 or sometimes 15 photos out of the many taken. And then they developed corresponding narratives for inclusion in the exhibit. So different photographs were often selected by participants and research team members based on how they touched them emotionally or the significance the picture had to a theme that emerged from previous interviews, for example. Um, but the participants were often quite adamant about specific photos that be included. And this cabbage <laughs> is an example. So this was a co-constructive process of meaning making between researchers and participants, but participants did exert considerable agency in their insistence on the inclusion of images that illustrated what Shankar in a 2016 article calls their authorship. And these examples can be found in Milena's picture in the previous slide. Um, she clearly wanted that to look very visually pleasing. In Robert's vibrant image of an expensive running shoe and Donisha's carefully curated display of nursing implements, and I'll feature both of these in subsequent slides, and in this image of a decorative cabbage by Song Jung Suk. Now, the cabbage um, is something that she grows, and it reminds her of the fact that when she was a child in Korea, her family was starving and food was very hard to come by. So for, for her now in later life, growing food is incredibly important, but we might look at that and not see the meaning in it. But above and beyond the meaning, Song Jung Suk really likes how visually this image looks. It's very visually pleasing. It makes an aesthetic impression. And Shankar gently um, critiques um, photo voice from the perspective that we must also remember that um, you know there's an artistic motive in the photographs that people take as well. It's not simply the meaning that researchers want to get out of it either. We also found the images selected to document elements of people's experience of aging in Canada sometimes drew a more more on the past than the present. So we were sort of really focused on, you know, what's important to you now. And then people will go away and take pictures of pictures. So Divine, for example, photographed a previous photo she had taken of birds. And these represented the freedom she's lost since an accident together with Bell's palsy left her with a permanent disability. And Rafi on the right preferred to present images of himself as a younger man. All of his images were pictures of pictures with greater physical capability and social capital than he could lay claim to at the time of the interview. So both may be viewed, both authorship and past orient, you know, focusing on these past orientations may be viewed as limitations, but I would argue that both of them tell stories on their own. 
The images that people choose can summarize unspeakable pain and suffering as well. Farzana survived really uh, unspeakable violence and trauma in Afghanistan and used her pho photographs to convey both the importance of the past to the present and to capture an unusual symbol of the freedom she now perceives in Canada. So the image on the bottom right is the book cover that she selected for the autobiography she's working on, although she still becomes very overwhelmed by memories and finds it very difficult to complete this project. Rosanna chose this image as representative of her life's path that began with her struggles from childhood. The image of the mall at Christmas represents for her a sense of peace that she wishes for her homeland, which is interesting. I, I don't think most of us would look at it that way, but that's, uh, that's uh, representative of a very different reality that she's living now. More typically though, these images documented elements of people's experience of aging in Canada from the struggles they face to the routine and every day, so often left unsaid. And so it's that every day, the little details that you don't tend to talk about in an interview that these images can capture. For example, this picture of a potential rental home was taken by Kim Young Chul through the rainy window of a car rented by his visiting niece in his ongoing search for affordable housing. He and his wife live in his daughter's home, which she hopes to sell now that she's moved to the US. It's distant from the services they use. They sometimes need to travel two hours each way to reach them. Young Chul's wife has her osteoarthritis, which limits her mobility, and he is seeing impaired, so he can't drive anymore. In the absence of their daughter, who used to take care of all of their daily affairs, uh, well, that needed English language, they feel relatively isolated. They relied on their daughter extensively for interpretation and navigation when they arrived because they were busy running their own business. And as a result, they didn't learn English, which is very common of Korean immigrants in particular. Um, so now they're struggling to find affordable rental accommodation. Language, lack of transportation to view housing options, a limited income and a lack of knowledge of avail available financial supports and navigation assistance are huge impediments. And um, this image really drives that home in terms of what that ends up meaning for them. Now, not all of the stories are negative stories. And here we have Mercedes family who came to Canada from Colombia as refugees. And she's proud of the love and support she receives from multiple generations of family members, but not every immigrant senior finds himself in this position. And I think what's interesting about this photograph is the inclusion of a photograph like this tells a story in and of itself because every single individual had to provide permission for the photograph to be taken and shared and you can see they're really into it the solidarity of the three generations of women pictured here is also evident in their willingness to comply with this requirement as well as their presence at the photo voice exhibit in montreal they were all there <laughs> So um, this image though uh, also speaks to family, but in a different way. For many like Isabel, migration entails separation from beloved family members. And for many years, she's worked hard to provide financial support to her parents in the Philippines. In their absence, she provides practical and emotional support to fictive kin, such as her godmother or Ninan pictured here. Isabel spoke in her interview about her regret that she wasn't able to physically uh, be physically present to support her own parents in the Philippines as their health waned. Her inclusion of this photograph underscored the guilt she felt at not having done so and her efforts to compensate for that. It also highlights the cultural importance of fictive kin and Isabel's efforts to support her community by sponsoring the immigration of family members to Canada, providing care to individuals like the godmother in need, and organizing community events in her efforts to provide cultural continuity, particularly for the young. Oops. So here's the running shoe. 
After arriving in Vancouver with his wife in 2005 and being financially dependent on his children, Robert has started to receive his government pension. Now at that time, um, there was a 10 year provision, a uh, waiting period before you could receive that pension. So he waited 10 years, which is good because he arrived already quite elderly. Um, now that has been increased to a 20 year wait. Um, so receiving the pension has given him some financial freedom to do what he wants to do. He's not affluent, but uh, certainly has more than pocket money. And he's eager to visit the Philippines so that he can deliver the shoes he's bought for his son. His focus on his son and family back home as opposed to the daughter in Canada that he lives with would not have emerged had we not included the photo voice component. Donisha's pride in her nursing qualifications and her struggles to requalify as a psychiatric nurse in Canada dominated her interview. Her efforts to resume her nursing career were delayed by more than 10 years due to French language requirements that Donisha depicts as racist efforts by the Quebec government to keep black nurses out of work. She nonetheless balances the story of disempowerment due to migration with many stories of resistance. Contrary to traditional gender roles in her community, she now enjoys playing the steel pan and woodworking as in the second photograph here. So these are stories of empowerment in relation to her migration. So we see in the sample considerable heterogeneity despite common experiences of structural stressors such as immigration policies, poverty, lifelong access barriers and so on. Challenges and traumas that have arisen as a cause and consequence of our participants' migration, including war-related trauma, family separation, and employment discrimination, have had a clear impact on their values and identities, contributing not only to their vulnerability, but also to their resilience. And finally, the stories they tell counteract the discourse on passivity and dependency. Older adults are active agents as providers, advocates um, of the family locally and internationally and of the community in its own right. And this was um, an important tension that arose in our research. So we as researchers tend to focus more uh, on the structure and interpretive macro level experiences that people had uh, experienced. But participants spoke intentionally about their micro level experiences, what happened to them in particular, which is always the case, we, they speak to the concrete. In practice, this meant that while the researchers sought to focus more attention during data collection on questions related to structural oppression, most of our participants across sites chose to move beyond issues of social exclusion, placing emphasis instead on their triumphs over adversity. And as a result, we had to modify our initial coding book template, which initially included many more categories of exclusion than any other code. The participants' emphasis on their agency was especially apparent when they were invited to co-create guiding questions for their photographs and to take photographs independent of the researchers. Participants photographed and explained their relationships and commitments to family, roles related to intergenerational and transnational reciprocity, activities that brought meaning to their lives, including activism and support to new immigrants, faith as, as a strength, and their love of nature, things that we wouldn't have thought about necessarily. So sharing decision-making power in this way resulted in valuable new insights and perspectives that would have otherwise been lost in the pursuit of pre-existing theoretical ideas. Just very briefly, um, sorry, I'm just checking the time. Yeah, okay. Um, I would like just to touch on some uh, our, our knowledge translation activities that emerged from the project. So uh, we've already mentioned that at the conclusion of our research, we set up some very well attended photo voice exhibits based on this work, both in Van Vancouver and Montreal, and they were both held over two days with different attendees. Feedback from community members and frontline workers was extremely positive. So there are, uh, we had uh, little cards that people could write on uh, with their impressions of the exhibit and we collated them all 
in the catalog, but here's just a couple of examples. The first one's a bit hard to read, so I'll read it. It says, I feel very lucky to be able to appreciate my grandma's life from other eyes. It makes me and my family bring memories of our life with her and experience immigrating to Canada. I hope better services could be offered to our elders in our communities while younger generations can hear and learn more from elders' knowledge. And then you can read the second. I was happy to hear our stories told. I want our grandchildren to know that we survived hardships by loving and helping each other. Thank you for amplifying our voices. So um, these were these were great. Uh, a couple of feedback from you know uh, family and a, a particular individual who was involved. In Vancouver, the Sunset Community Center asked us to leave the exhibit up for more than an additional month because their patrons were very interested in it. It was in a public area hallway. Subsequently, three senior centers in the greater Vancouver area borrowed the exhibit. But despite this, we knew that the turnout of decision makers at the exhibit was low. And that's who we really wanted to reach. So as a result, we uh, went after a little more money. Uh, we were able to secure uh, Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research REACH grant in BC, as well as a SHIRT Connections grant to extend our work in not only Montreal, but Quebec and Calgary as well. And we partnered with local agencies in Vancouver. These were the United Way of the Lower Mainland, the Canadian Center for Elder Law, and Mosaic in particular. Mosaic especially um, provided space, whereas uh, United Way of the Lower Mainland helped with organization and uh, recruitment of people to the, uh, to the events that we held. So we specifically invited decision makers and other stakeholders to targeted workshops. Uh, there were three of them, one on housing, transportation and disability, one on social isolation and connection, and a third on family caregiving and home care, to which we invited the seniors advocate who uh, gave a little talk and participated fully in, in the process, which was great. Um, so here's one of the stakeholder meetings. See the agenda is that we have somebody present on the topic. Um, so for this one, which is on disability, we had Krista James from the Canadian Centre for Elder Law uh, give uh, a brief talk on the topic because she's done a great deal of work around that area. Um, people would then view the exhibit and we'd engage them in a world cafe process where you have uh, people, uh, that's me there at the table and I've got other team members, um, students, uh, you know, as the recorders at different tables and the participants move between the tables. So the table topic stays the same, but they cover three different topics. And partway through, we shifted the questions from impressions of the, you can see the question there, what are your impressions about disability in relation to immigrant older adults based on viewing this exhibit? And then we would shift to um, solutions. So at the different tables, people would speak to either disability, transportation or housing. And then um, we would report back on these, uh, on these collective um, uh, uh, notes that would include the uh, input in the end of all of the participants because everybody eventually comes to all of the tables. So we have a report back and then a full group discussion in which you can see uh, Emily taking notes on uh, people's overall impressions. And all of these ended up um, being recorded as uh, we wanted to get reports back quickly to people. So we had these quick turnaround reports for each meeting that we sent out to all participants because we wanted them to have that information. Um, and then uh, we took a little bit more time and sifted through them and came up with policy briefs specifically on the uh, first and the last themes. Um, the one in the middle was uh, 
a little snowed out actually. <laughs> um, so we, we had some interesting discussions, but we decided that these two were the most powerful in terms of uh, policy briefs. And then nationally, we held meetings in Calgary, Greater Montreal and Quebec City. And out of this produced a national report, which is available in French and English and can be found at these links. But everything, um, to do with this project, all the links can be found on my uh, on my website. So uh, that's the Sharon K Research uh, You go to areas of expertise, aging and immigration, or just go straight to this link and then scroll down to lived experiences. And within that, sorry, hammering in the background, within that, um, there you will find links to these various um, products that we have produced, including our publications, um, usually through ResearchGate. And there is my email if you'd like to get in touch with me. So I 